I'm Lynn Hicks of uh, the Des Moines Register's editorial board, and we're here with our endorsement interview of Dr. Ben Carson, who's running for the Republican nomination for the presidency. Dr. Carson, welcome. Well, thank you. Nice and to be back. And we're going to start with just having the editorial board, which is sitting close here, <coughs> introduce themselves. Emily Nash, executive editor. I'm Clark Kaufman. I'm an editorial writer here. I'm Rachel Basu. I'm an opinion columnist. Mm -hmm. David Shivers, President and Publisher. Brian Smith, Engagement Editor. You look too young to be that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. we're, we're working on that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting older by the day. All right. uh, we just would like you to start off by telling us why we should consider endorsing you for the nomination. OK. Well, first of all, you know, why did I even get into this? Uh, after an arduous career in neurosurgery, 15,000 operations, uh, I was very much looking forward to retirement. My wife was looking forward to it even more than I was. Uh, but after so many people started clamoring for me to get involved after the prayer breakfast, uh, I kind of ignored it at first and said, ah, don't worry about it, that'll go away. But it didn't go away, it kept building. And pretty soon I was getting 5,000 petitions every week. I had literally hundreds of thousands, boxes filling every room. And I said, well, I don't really see this as my calling in life, but I said, Lord, if you really want me to do this, you have to open the doors because all the professionals say it's impossible for somebody like me. Uh, <clears throat> but if you open the doors, I'll walk through them. And uh, the doors began to open. And we felt that really there was no way financially to be able to run an organization because of my personal philosophy, <clears throat> which is not to take money from billionaires who want to influence you and not to take special interest money. Uh, I just believe that that's one of the scourges of our society has really caused us a lot of problems and distorted the system that was intended for our country. Uh, nevertheless, we were still able to raise a lot of money from We the People. Um, now, the initial startup cost of, of raising money is very high, and I think a lot of people who understand the political arena know that. Uh, if you have an organization already, you're a governor, you're a senator, the costs are not nearly as high. But to start from scratch with no donor base, uh, nothing, uh, is expensive. Uh, that expense comes down every month and is now down considerably. Um, have, however, having said that, starting a novice organization, we put together people I had to take the words of a lot of people because I didn't know anybody. Um, and it was quite credible uh, and creditable, the job that they did and getting me, uh, you know, where I was. It was almost impossible task and yet they did it. And yet I was able to see that things were not moving the way that they needed to move. The messaging wasn't what it needed to be. Um, there was a lot of animosity between you know, my campaign and the media which caused the media to start looking for other routes to get to me and that's how the whole Armstrong Williams thing started. Um, and I just did a deep dive and I realized that it wasn't working optimally and we didn't have a good operator. One of the things that I learned in my 18 years on the Kellogg Board of Directors and 16 years on Costco is that when things don't work, you know, you have a few options. You can ignore it. Uh, you can double down on what you're doing where you can do a deep dive analysis, figure out what the problem is, and correct it. And particularly, it frequently requires someone with operational ability. There are a lot of people who can talk and who actually espouse very good ideals, but don't know how to actually execute. And that's what was needed. Having put that in place uh, has been tremendous. You've already seen things happening. You've already seen our tax policy come out, which I've been trying to get out for months. 
uh, and you're going to see a bunch of other policies coming out very shortly so that people will not have to guess. And, you know, as you saw, Forbes said that our tax plan is the best one. They're going to be saying that about a lot of our policies, quite frankly, uh, as they come out. Because, you know, I'm not a highly partisan person, but I'm very concerned about America. So the things that I talk about, they're not Democrat or Republican things. They're American things. The things that concern me are the divisiveness that are going on in our society, all the wedges that are being driven between the people. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And yet, you know, we have a war on women, racial wars, age wars, income wars, religious wars, everything imaginable. And previously, our strength has been our unity. And that is something that I think should be very high on the agenda for the next leader of this nation. It has not been high on the agenda most recently. I think fiscal responsibility is another thing that's very important. The current generation is the first generation in our nation's history that will be worse off than the previous generation. And the generation after that will be worse, and the one after that worse. Why? Because of our policies. As we continue to run up our national debt, as the fiscal gap continues to increase, and no one even talks about it. It's sort of like, eh, they're just numbers. They don't matter. And yet, they're impacting our society. You know, why does the Fed central bank have to utilize the policies it does. Why can't they raise the interest rates to a normal level? Because our national debt is so high, because the debt service on it is so high. And who does that impact the most? Average people, middle class and poor people, who now no, no, no longer have a mechanism for increasing their wealth. They used to be able to put 5% of their check in the bank every Friday and watch it grow over a few decades and have a nice nest egg and be able to retire. That's gone. The bond market doesn't work for them. The only thing that works is the stock market. But you have to have risk tolerance to be able to use that. The average American doesn't have that. Rich people do. Income cap grows. It's not because rich people are evil. It's because of this silly policy of continuing to run up our debt so that we can't adjust our monetary policies in a way that is beneficial to the average American. Also, the, the huge number of regulations, I'm not an anti-regulation person, but recognize what the deleterious effect of those regulations are. Every single regulation costs money in terms of goods and services. It's a very regressive tax that is imposed upon our society. And who does it hurt? when you go into the store and buy a box of detergent and it costs 10 cents more because of regulation. Rich people don't notice that. Poor people don't notice it right away. Middle class notices when they get to the cash register and everything has gone up a little bit and they don't feel that their quality of life is the same as it used to be but can't quite put their finger on the reason why that is the case. And then you look at the deleterious effect of, of all the regulations. Manufacturing segment, for instance. Uh, the regulations per capita in the manufacturing industry for companies with employees of less than 50 is $34,000. It makes it really hard to compete, particularly with other countries, when we do things like that. When we have the highest corporate tax rates, of course we're going to drive business out of here. And it would be so simple for us to lower that system. That's why you know, I've come up with a tax plan that is a flat rate across the board for everybody with no deductions and no exemptions because as soon as you put in a deduction or an exemption everybody starts manipulating everything to be able to take advantage of it and some people can take advantage of it better than others we need something that is completely fair and that's why I like the ideal proportionality uh, you know I think God's pretty fair and he had proportionality and tithe he said he didn't say if you have a bumper crop you owe me triple tithe he didn't say if your crops fail you owe me nothing and so I, it's a simplistic ideal, but it works. And you don't get to inject your ideological preferences into it. You know, you make $10 billion a year proportionally, you pay a billion. You make $10 a year, you pay one. You get the same rights and privileges. If your neighbor makes 10 times more money than you do, they pay 10 times more taxes than you do. It makes it very, very simple.
um, and in terms of just the corporate uh, rate, uh, there's over $2.1 trillion overseas. Uh, if uh, we provide a mechanism to bring that money back, it will come back. And what I've suggested is a six-month hiatus on corporate taxes. They pay zero. We repatriate that money, the only stipulation being that 10 percent of it has to be used in empowerment zones and to create jobs for people who are unemployed and on welfare. It would be the biggest stimulus since FDR's New Deal and wouldn't cost the taxpayers one penny. Low-hanging fruit, and it gets corporate America to start thinking about investing in their communities, investing in people around them, because I really believe that it is a responsibility of the private sector to take care of the downtrodden. It is not the government's responsibility. And when the government began taking that over, that's when we started accumulating unreasonable debts. You know, uh, Johnson's, uh, you know, war on poverty. How'd that work out? Nineteen trillion dollars later, we have ten times more people on food stamps, more welfare, more poverty, broken homes, crime, incarceration. Everything is not only worse, it's much worse. And it doesn't mean that the government is evil and horrible. It simply means that they're doing the wrong thing. And it's the private sector. The government can help facilitate the private sector, facilitate life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but not insinuate itself into every aspect of our lives. It is not the way the system was designed. And, you know, in, t in terms of the way the system was designed, it was also designed for citizen statesmen, uh, not for career politicians. And uh, career politicians would have you believe that they're the only ones who can solve the problems. But, you know, we got almost 9,000 years of experience in Congress, and they're not solving our problems. Uh, we need to look for people who have a long history of solving problems. You know, I have been involved in solving a lot of problems. My neurosurgical career was fraught with controversy because I tended to push the envelope. You know, for instance, with achondroplast, you know, the most common form of dwarfism. Seven percent of them used to die in infancy. Uh, it was a well-known problem. Uh, when I came up with a mechanism for fixing it, there was outrage. And they said, you surgeons are the ones who kill these people, because when people would go in, the area was so tight, they frequently did kill them or made them worse. But we figured out a way to do it without doing that. And I was reported to the Maryland Medical Society, the AMA, Carson's a wild man. But by that time, you know, I had done enough cases I could reveal the data. And in medicine, unlike politics, data does matter. And now, you know, it's a standard technique used all over the world, and achondroplasts no longer, 7% of them die in infancy. Same thing with brain stem tumors, with a lot of the seizure procedures. Um, and it's, it's not because I'm the smartest person that ever existed in the world, not by a long shot, but by working with people. A lot of people, we were able to define the problems, we were able to look at data, we were able to figure out what was going on and how to fix it. And I think that's a paradigm that works in politics as well. I'm going to stop you there. I'll, we'll ask some questions about okay. some of the things you talked about. First, I want to talk about something that's in the news right now. Uh, something, we're not really clear what happened in North Korea yesterday, mm -hmm. last night. What is the proper response and how would you respond as president to, to okay. a situation like that? Well, uh, you know, first of all, uh, I think North Korea is a very dangerous regime, uh, particularly with, with Kim Jong-un, uh, who seems to be somewhat unstable and unpredictable. And we need to try to keep him under control. Now, whether they actually exploded a hydrogen bomb or not, who knows? Uh, but I think it's always safer to assume the worst than to assume the best. Uh, in order to keep him under control, I think we need to work with China uh, because, you know, China is really their lifeline. And uh, working with them uh, to try to keep him under control, uh, you know, th reimposing severe sanctions uh, when he starts doing things that he's not supposed to do. You know, there are treaties that says he's not supposed to be exploding nuclear weapons. So if he does, that justifies the imposition of severe sanctions in those situations. Um, but I think another thing that we need to be thinking about, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan was severely uh, criticized and ridiculed when he talked about, you know, Star Wars defense. Um, but the fact of the matter is, whether it's Kim Jong-un, uh, whether it's Ali Khomeini, 
you know, uh, whether it's some terrorist group. As much as we don't want this to happen, eventually they're going to have nuclear weapons. Eventually they're going to have nuclear capabilities. And uh, we need to be able to defend ourselves, so we need to be working on strategic defense initiatives. And uh, one of the things I think that is very important is we need to re-engage ourselves in space. You know, we've largely abandoned our space program, I think to our detriment, because one of the reasons we were able to stay so far out in front of everybody else in our offensive and defensive military capabilities was because of the many discoveries that came out of the space program. Uh, even our everyday lives are affected by it. Our cell phones came out of the space program. And as we've abandoned that, you know, people have caught up with us. Uh, there may be even some who have surpassed us. This is not something that we can afford to do. So it's not about men walking on Mars. It's about the kind of technology, the kind of innovation that really keeps us up front. And in the future, he who controls space will control the Earth. And it is going to be our capabilities of monitoring when somebody launches a nuclear weapon and the ability to track it and to shoot it down before it reaches us. This is absolutely critical for us. We also need to respond to the cyber attacks from Korea. You know, um, when somebody hits us with a cyber attack, we should return the fire. And it should be so severe that they would never even consider doing such a thing again. But we can't be afraid to do that. Our offensive capabilities in cyber are very substantial. Our defensive capabilities still need some work. And I think there needs to be a public-private uh, partnership, uh, take advantage of a lot of the innovation that has come out of Silicon Valley and other places, working along with our government. But, you know, this affects us all. We need to be talking about our electrical grid. You know, we have to harden that. This is absolutely critical. Uh, all it takes is an electromagnetic pulse. Those come from the sun every approximately 150 years. The last one was 155 years ago. With our grid the way it is right now, an EMP today could set us back 40 years makes us extremely vulnerable. So could a nuclear blast in our exo-atmosphere. And uh, if that was coordinated with multiple cyber attacks and a few dirty bombs, can you imagine what would happen? We have to protect ourselves. Can I ask you to back up just a little bit? You mentioned earlier the responsibility uh, for taking care of the downtrodden. And, and you would acknowledge that the federal government has a responsibility to act as a safety net, I'm assuming. Um, I don't have any problem with safety nets. There's been a false narrative about me. People say, well, Carson grew up very poor, and he must have benefited from go some government programs, and therefore now he wants to take them all away. What a piece of crap, you know. But, you know, people just come out with all of these lies all the time. That's probably the most disappointing part of this whole process is the lack of integrity uh, in the press. I mean, unbelievable stuff. I mean, I even saw an article yesterday in Yahoo News that was still talking about, you know, saying that Carson was dishonest about a class at Yale that he took where he was the most honest student. When that's already, the article has been found that showed that that was true. And they're still, you know, propagating these lies. It's, it's just horrible. But at any rate, I have no desire to get rid of safety nets for people who need them. My emphasis is on providing ladders of opportunity to allow people to climb out of a state of dependency and become part of the fabric of America. That's where the emphasis we'll needs to be. Ladders, it, it sounds like you're thinking that that's a job that should be left more to the public sector. I think the, 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 private, the sector, private sector, yeah, the private sector is the place where those things are done the best. It's relationships with other people. You know, there's a program, for instance, uh, in Tennessee, uh, where they go out and they find people, private sector, who are down and out, and they bring them into a program that they pay for, 13-week program, clean them up, give them new clothes, you know. This is a nonprofit type organization. Nonprofit, yeah. And um, teach them what they need to know in order to hold a job. Help them get a job. Talk to their employers, work with their employees. 70% of those people wind up off the dole in less than a year. 
And one young lady I talked to, when they found her, she was homeless and a drug addict. When I talked to her, she was three months away from getting her PhD. You know, what can happen when we are willing to invest in people? And the reason that's so important is because we only have 330 million people in our country. We're competing with, with China with 1.4 billion, uh, with India with over a billion. We can't afford to waste any of our people. We can't afford to have 20% of everybody who enters high school not finishing high school in this country. We've, we've got to start thinking about how do we develop our people. We have to start looking at education and recognizing what works and what doesn't work. You know, when we look at the statistics, homeschoolers do best, private schoolers next best, charter schoolers next best, public schoolers worse. Uh, now, let's not just know that. Let's do something about that. In terms of actually helping folks, um, you're, you're looking more at churches and charities than, say, the federal government. Right. The federal government, I think, can help facilitate uh, and coordinate those efforts. And but the, but the, reason, well, well, the reason I don't particularly like to have the federal government doing these things is because they don't seem to be able to resist the urge to become big bureaucratic uh, operations. And, and that's what I'm interested in. What, what sort of programs are you talking about that are these big bureaucratic things that, that need to be scaled back or maybe even eliminated? Uh, almost everything in government. You know, there's a 645 government agencies and sub-agencies. 645. There's 4.1 million federal employees. I mean, just think about those numbers. That's staggering. Um, and in terms of trimming them back, what I would personally do is recognize that tens of thousands of those federal employees retire each year. Don't rehire them. You can shift people around to make sure critical positions are covered, but don't keep hiring people and let that die by attrition and get down to an efficient level. With all those 645 agencies and sub-agencies, I would bring in the director of every single one of them and I would say, Cut your budget by 2 to 3 percent. And if you can't do that, give me your resignation right now. Anybody who tells me there's not 2 to 3 percent fat, uh, I, I don't think they're dealing with reality. And not only that, but I would tell them you have to do it in a way that the public won't even know that you did it. Because the last time you remember a few years ago with the sequestration, uh, people were told to cut their budget, but I think they were told just the opposite. They said cut it in the way that the people feel it the most so that nobody would be talking about cutting budgets anymore. That's ridiculous. And, uh, you know, the amount of money that we waste, you know, for instance, the government owns 900,000 buildings. 77,000 of those buildings are either not utilized or underutilized, and yet we lease 500 million square feet of space using taxpayers' money. Does that make any sense? You know, you see these kinds of things all over the place. And one of the things that I learned in, in the business world is how to be efficient, how to use money efficiently, um, how to use things like the Lean Six Sigma program. Some of you have probably heard of that. It's applied uh, you know, to corporations, Toyota, 3M. A lot of businesses have used it. Usually it gets them at, at least uh, 25% savings and enormous amount of efficiency. Can you imagine what happens when we start applying programs like that to the federal government? I think it needs to be done. We, the American people deserve to have a government that is run efficiently and not like this garbage that we have right now. It's one of the reasons that uh, no one in the traditional political arena is enthusiastic about me, and they shouldn't be because I'm not going to abide by all of the crap that, that's been going on. You know, the government needs to be returned to the people. It needs to be working for the people. It needs to be truly transparent. There needs to be some integrity. People need to believe in the government again. You, oh, I'm Go sorry. Ahead, I, last month, I think you made some comments that you have yet to see evidence of racial bias in policing. Is that, is that a fair assessment of what uh, you said? I, no, I don't think that's what I said. What I said is that the vast, vast majority of police are honest, decent, hardworking people. There are some bad police. There is no question about that. Just like there are bad teachers and bad doctors and nurses, even bad journalists. 
Uh, but we don't judge the whole group, you know, by what's done there. And rather than, you know, casting stones and aspersions, why don't we look at how we fix the problem? The problem, I believe, is fixed by relationships. Uh, you know, when I went to Ferguson this summer and I talked to the police, you know, to the city officials, to business owners who were hurt during the riots, to people who were in the riots, all in the same room, um, I was so shocked by the level of cordiality that existed there and the respect they had for each other. Why? Because they had been having regular meetings. They knew each other. They were on a first name basis with each other. And they were making real progress. It was because of the relationships. And that's what we're going to have to do. We have to introduce police into the communities early and often so that they are known, so they're, that they're not feared, they're part of the community. I was talking to a police officer in Baltimore this summer. He said he makes it his duty every day to go to the neighborhood, to walk through the neighborhood. Everybody knows him. He says he never has to buy lunch. People always invite him in for lunch. You know, I mean, this is what happens when people begin to know each other. And that's how we solve that problem. We're not going to solve it, I don't think, in any other way. I do like the ideal of the body cameras. I think it protects both the police and the populace. But we also need to emphasize the importance of respect. People need to respect the police. The police need to respect the people. And, you know, I was talking to one lady in Ferguson. She said, you know, it was 2 in the morning. There were all these lights, police cars in her neighborhood. She came out and she said to one of the policemen, well, what's going on? He said, go back in the house. It doesn't concern you. That's not showing respect for people. This is their neighborhood. You know, so we have to teach the police to respect the people. We have to teach the people to respect the police. I want to ask you about the, <clears throat> if we can go back to your tax plan, the flat tax mm -hmm. plan. Um, so this would lower taxes for the wealthiest households, and it would, everybody would pay something. It would it probably is going to increase taxes for the poorest. Right. Even even the people at uh, below the 150 uh, percent poverty line have to pay something. We call it de minimis tax. It would be like 100 bucks. But that way, everybody has some skin in the game. So uh, how do you sell this to the majority of Americans? Where, where does middle class see their, this benefiting them? I, I think we sell it by telling people that every policy that we push is talking about equality, liberty and justice for everybody, treating everybody the same. And, you know, the vast majority of Americans in, in this tax plan, as you go through it and you analyze it, uh, very few people, if anybody, is going to be paying more. But um, in terms of the wealthy, you say that it gives them a big tax increase. What you have to recognize is that many of the wealthy are not paying their fair share of taxes right now. I know a lot of wealthy people, I mean really wealthy people, who don't pay as much as I pay. I pay a lot because I don't have all these shelters and tax accountants and lawyers. Um, and, you know, we have costed this out. We have analyzed it all because we want to make sure that, you know, we're basically revenue neutral, that we're able to take care of all the duties of the government. Everybody needs to participate that, in that, and they need to participate it in a fair way. And I don't think uh, the American people are going to be opposed to having something that treats everybody the same. If your neighbor makes 10 times more money than you do, your neighbor pays 10 times more than you do. I think people are going to like that. Help me with the math on the revenue neutral, because PolitiFact has said, has agreed with the statement that there's a $1 trillion shortfall. So where, tell me how they're wrong and, and it's actually revenue neutral. Well, uh, none of that has taken into account the tremendous spurring of the economy that this is going to create, nor has it taken into account the fact that we're going to be reducing the size of government through attrition and through cutting the various federal agency programs. It, which but is which is going to be a lot more than 1.1 trillion dollars, by the way. It's going to be a lot more. The cuts will be more than 1.1. It'll be a lot more. But you're also talking about. You previously talked about uh, increasing spending on the strategic defense initiative and technology and other things to protect us. And the space program, obviously, that's going to talk, 
cost a lot of money. So where where's that money coming from? Well, recognize that there is an enormous amount of money that is not being tapped. You know, our country, in terms of assets, owns well more than $150 trillion. Now, if you take a well-run business and you give them $150 trillion in assets, even if they only get a 2% return on it, it's going to be an enormous amount of money. Not only are we not getting a return on our assets, we're actually paying money because we run things so inefficiently. So you mentioned in the beginning that uh, some things about your campaign and how you wanted to get this tax policy out sooner. So what happened and what happened in the campaign? Uh, we, we didn't have operators. We had people say, well, wait a minute, let's, and let's, well, let's see, but, you know, you know how that works. Uh, and that just doesn't get things done. And, you know, I, I have a surgical personality. Uh, if you know anything about medicine, surgical personalities, we like to get stuff done. We don't like to sit around and talk about it all day long. So where is it going from here in terms of your campaign? Some have suggested that this shows some faltering of the campaign, but it sounds like you're recalibrating to be able to get some more action. Is that? Yeah, I, I think what, what faltering would be is recognizing that there's a problem and shutting your eyes and not doing anything about it. That would be a real problem. Now, you know, I don't, you know, get upset by the fact that people criticize whatever I do. If I don't do anything, they're going to criticize it. If I do do something, they're going to criticize it. You know, that's life in the big city. That's just going to happen. Don't worry about that. You just worry about getting stuff done. Well, one of the things you suggested is, uh the, you know, the notion of the Department of Education monitoring institutions of higher learning for extreme political bias. How would, how would that work and where would the monitoring take place and okay. what would people be looking for? Uh, well, basically, when complaints are heard, you know, from students or from other faculty members, um, you would go in and investigate. You can do that rather surreptitiously. Um, and you find out whether there's any validity to it. To, to political bias, say, in the it, classroom, yeah, or the library? Right. Or the, For instance, uh, just as an example, uh, you probably know this example already, but at one of these colleges in Florida, one of the professors uh, told the students as an assignment to all take out a piece of paper and write the name Jesus on it, and then to put it on the ground and stomp on it. And one of the students refused to do that, and uh, he wound up being disciplined. Um, you know, there turned out to be enough ruckus about it, and eventually, you know, they rectified it. But that's, that's what I call extreme political bias. Well, the, the reason I ask is, that, I mean, there are some people who suggest that having a federal agency uh, investigate college campuses for political bias, it, 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 it leans a little bit toward thought police. No, I, don't, I don't think so. I think when we're talking about federal taxpayer dollars going to an institution that is educating our children. I don't care whether the extreme political bias is coming from the right or the left, it shouldn't be there. Institutions of higher education are supposed to be just for that, higher education. That means you have to be able to look at everything. You need to be able to discuss these things because these are people who are going to be leaders in our society. They cannot be sheltered. Uh, you know, they, when you get out in the real world, there's no safe zone. Let me go over here so nobody will say something that will offend me. You know, that's craziness. That's not what we want to be teaching our students. We want to teach our students to be able to look at, listen to, and evaluate and discuss everything. And when that's not happening, we are doing ourselves a disservice. We are weakening ourselves, and we are setting ourselves up for failure. But do you trust a federal agency to, to do that role, given your concerns about overregulation and other uh, power by the, the federal uh, government? Again, guidelines would have to be in place. You know, I, 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 I take it a step further. I believe in the secret shopper concept, you know, for, for all government agencies. You know, I believe that there should be people out there who are acting as consumers and seeing if we are taking care of them appropriately. 
And you don't have to have very many people. You just need to have people know that they could be out there. Are you talking about, for example, federal employees maybe infiltrating classrooms or libraries? And not just classrooms and libraries, but uh, anything that the taxpayers are paying for, we ought to be monitoring it and making sure that it is done appropriately. There should not be such a political bias is what we're still talking about. No, in regard to inefficiency, in regard to unresponsiveness. You know, when you have a, a problem and you go to the Federal Housing Administration and you talk to people and it takes you four hours to talk to somebody and then they blow you off and you don't get anything okay. done, you know. I want to know about those kinds of things, and I want to know what can be done to fix those kinds of things. American people should not be subject to that. It sounds like you're, you're, you're suggesting a, a, a radical transformation in the way people view federal government, that you want the I, people to trust I them. want them to trust the federal government. I want the federal government to work. And, and how, can you, how are you going to... What's the first thing you're going to do to do that? Well, first of all, you know, I'm, as, as the... Um, if I'm president, I will talk to everybody. I will tell them what the vision is for how we should be working. And I will tell everybody that we welcome them, we welcome their suggestions in terms of how we make sure that we have a government that is responsible, but also we'll let them know that we are going to be holding people responsible for what's done, just like we do in the private sector. We would do the same thing in the government. The people deserve no less than that. Let's talk a little bit about foreign policy, and you've been criticized um, on your expertise in that area. It sounds like that's part of uh, when you've uh, uh, switched up your advisors and gotten new people. So tell me, what, what have you done to get up to speed on foreign policy? Well, uh, I have talked to a lot of people, um, you know, former um, uh, government officials, uh, generals, policy advisors. Um, I think I've become very conversant, quite frankly, in foreign policy. Uh, and, and therefore, you will see, if you ask me a foreign policy per question, you won't get what you get from most of the candidates, which is, you know, a 30-second or one-minute spiel, which always says the same thing. Uh, I think my knowledge has increased dramatically. Uh, but having said that, I also recognize that no matter how much you learn, you're never going to be the world expert in, you know, Russian affairs or in Islam, even though I can tell you a lot about both of those things. But recognize the Bible says in Proverbs 11:14, in the multitude of counselors is safety. And that's what I've done. I've gotten a multitude of counselors. Uh, I get to hear viewpoints of lots of different ways to take care of ISIS. Um, uh, lots of different approaches to taking care of the safety of our citizens in this country. And uh, I'm ready to, uh, to wax on any of those subjects in some depth. You said at a campaign stop earlier this week that you would starve ISIS out in Syria. What did you mean by that? Well, uh, as you may remember, about six or seven weeks ago <coughs> in Sinjar, which had been taken over by ISIS, um, what we did in working in conjunction with the Kurds and our special ops people is we cut off the supply routes to Sinjar. Uh, that softened the target so that uh, we were then able to go in with the Kurds and our special ops followed by our Air Force and was able to take that city pretty easily. Uh, same kind of thing that I'm talking about. When we look at their command and control center in Raqqa, there's only four entry and exit routes. Uh, you can take control of those. You can soften them. And then, you know, we can tell where they are. We know where they are. Uh, our special ops people can go in there at 2 in the morning and raid those areas. And uh, we can make life very miserable for them. I don't see any reason at all why we let them sit up there and smoke their fat cigars. You know, we ought to make life very, very difficult for them. Uh, 
Uh, you talked a little bit earlier about holding government accountable. Um, a lot of fact checks of statements that you've made during this campaign have come back saying that they were inaccurate or untrue. How do you give me an example accountable for those? Give me an example. Sure. Let me pull because it virtu- the fact here. But when when I look at a lot of the stuff that people have accused me of, and then we come back and demonstrate that it's not true, how come nobody ever retracts it? Um, have you talked to? I mean, Politifact has done a number of. of it. Politi- for example, the, are, it, are they a biased? Are they biased against you, or do you think? That <laughs> are they bi- They're not just biased against me. They're biased against a lot of people. You know, why don't they politif- check themselves sometimes? Why don't they check themselves? They never admit to being wrong about anything, and they're not right about everything by any stretch of the imagination. And a lot of times when they apply their criteria, they apply their criteria based on their ideology, not on objective evidence. So is there is there something specific? Because I can I can generally tell you what's behind anything that I've said. Um, so here's one example. That, um, you previously said that the Family Research Council, according to some ga- government agencies, is a terrorist group. PolitiFact rated this false, saying that the Southern Poverty Law Center had called them an extremist group, but that they could find no record of a single government agency referring to them as a terrorist group. Well, uh, when I referred to that, I was talking about the Southern uh, group, and I didn't refer them to them as a government agency. You're talking about the Southern, be, Southern Poverty Law Center. Yeah, be, be, because somebody says that I refer to them as a government agency doesn't mean that that's true. I know the Southern Poverty Law Center is not a government agency, but they did uh, make that claim. Mm-hmm. And they also put me on their list, said that, uh, you know, I was a terrorist. <laughs> but there was so much pushback on it that, that they rescinded that. One of the things that you had said that did cause a caused quite a storm of controversy was the comparison with the Affordable Care Act to slavery. Do you still think that's a valid comparison? Well, first of all, I don't think it was a comparison. I said it was the worst thing since slavery. That's not equating it to slavery by any stretch of the imagination. Slavery is by far, as I'm concerned, the worst thing that ever occurred in our society. Having said that, I do realize that that probably is the wrong kind of language to use. You notice I don't use that anymore because people focus on that and they don't focus on what you're saying. My point was that um, it shifts the dynamic between the government and the people and most people had no idea that that was happening. The people were supposed to be at the pinnacle, the government beneath them to facilitate life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. With the Affordable Care Act, the government comes along and says, don't care what you people think. This is what we're doing. We're shoving it down your throat, and if you don't like it, too bad. That fundamentally shifts the relationship between the people and the government. And it's one of the reasons that, you know, Stalin, Lenin, all these people, when you read their writings, they say, first thing you have to do is you take control of the most important thing that people have, which is their health care. And I don't think the average American has any idea what just happened. You've also alluded to the fact that the first thing they do is take people's guns. Do you think that's a valid comparison with what's happening in the United States today? Or well, I think we obviously need to be cognizant of the fact, you know, there's a whole list of countries where tyranny reigned and where the first thing they did was disarm the populace. So obviously it's something that we need to be very much aware of. We need to recognize that Second Amendment rights are there for a reason. We also need to recognize that we have to be responsible as a society. We need to be talking about how do we keep dangerous weapons out of the hands of mentally ill people. We need to be talking about how do we protect the children in our schools. Uh, you know, we, if we just get in our separate corners and fire shots at each other, no pun intended, that's not going to solve the problem. What do you think of the situation in Oregon? Well, I, I don't think, obviously, that we should condone, you know, lawlessness. Uh, there are other ways to make their protests. I do understand the issue. 
uh, you know, the Bureau of Land Management can be pretty heavy-handed. Uh, the federal government, there's no reason the federal government needs to own millions and millions of acres out there. I personally believe, I've said and I've written, uh, that we need to engage in a transfer of federal uh, lands to the states, where the states and the people of those states can then determine the best use of that land. There's absolutely no reason that the federal government has to own all that land. Talk a little bit about your fall in the polls. Um, I mean, is that, are you, what do you think the main reasons are behind it? You've I, talked I, a little bit about the media, you've talked about your campaign. I think problems. it's multifactorial. Um, you know, I've been hit with all kinds of accusations, you know, that, you know, you lied about, you know, your upbringing, you know, <coughs> and, you know, they go back to my old neighborhood, talk to people who knew me after <laughs> I had my violent temper. I mean, why would anybody else know about it? And they said, well, obviously it didn't happen. And then finally they find an article in Parade Magazine from 1997 where they did an extensive interview with my mother who talked all about my temper and all about those things. And they said, oh, never mind. And then they move on to the next thing. And then they say, well, you know, your West Point story, you know, it doesn't jive. You know, West Point doesn't give out scholarships. General Westmoreland was never in Detroit around that time. And then subsequently they find out on the West Point uh, uh, webpage that they do talk about giving scholarships, but they just talk about it in a different way. They did the same thing back then. Uh, and, and then they found out that he was in fact in Detroit for a Congressional Medal of Honor tenure, just like I described, but it was in February instead of May. You know, it was a long time, I didn't remember exactly which month it was. But do they go back and retract any of that? Absolutely not. And then they, you know, talked about, you know, class in Yale, where I was the most honest student. They said, obviously, he just made all that up. And then when the article was found to show that that actually did happen, eh, well, let's just move on. Never any retraction. You got all of that stuff hitting you. Uh, you know, Saturday Night Live making fun of you. I think I'm the first person who ever had four segments in one program. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, obviously, you know, they're concerned about me. Um, and then, you know, you have Paris, and then you have uh, San Bernardino, and you know, a lot of people with the narrative that because he's a nice guy and he's soft-spoken, he couldn't possibly be able to deal with terrorism. So I had a lot of stuff coming down on me all at the same time. And, you know, it's okay. I can deal with that. And, you know, I haven't given up. I'm going to continue to say the same things, uh, to bring logic and common sense to the people. And I do believe what Thomas Jefferson said. He said that, you know, before we turned into something else, the people would wake up and recognize what was going on and start thinking for themselves. And I believe that's exactly what's going to happen. I think we're all going to be surprised. On February 1st, you mean? Yes. Okay. Why do you think there has been such a focus on your personal life and your upbringing? Uh, because they can't find any scandals. You know, uh, everybody was absolutely certain they would find a, a scandal. This guy's been at Johns Hopkins for 36 years. There's got to be some nurse he's had an affair with. There's got to be something. And they can't find anything. And it's very frustrating. So they say, well, let's attack his character. People think that he's a good person and that he's honest. So let's see if we can destroy that. Um, that's, what, that's what's going on. You mentioned being soft-spoken. Do you think that that is a hindrance when you're going against people like Donald Trump? Uh, I think a lot of people equate, you know, loudness and brashness with strength. Um, I'm encouraging people uh, to look at records of accomplishment. What have people done? What have they accomplished in their lives? You know, is there a reason, for instance, that the the Library of Congress named me one of 89 living legends on the occasion of its 200th anniversary. Maybe there isn't. Maybe we should go back and look and see why that happened. Maybe there's a reason that I have 67 honorary doctorate degrees. I doubt anybody else has anywhere close to that. Probably you combine them all. You know, there's a reason for that. Obviously, a lot of accomplishment that has occurred. And, you know, I want to use that ability to get things done in conjunction with a lot of other extraordinarily talented people 
to solve the problems because I can't in good conscience sit back and watch what's happening to our country happen and not do anything about it. I just can't. Would I love to? Believe me, I would love to put my feet up and relax, but I can't do it. <laughs> we uh, have Senator Rubio coming in next. We'll have to wrap this up soon. What question would you ask him? Um, I, will, I might ask him, what is the advantage of accepting money from very rich people who want to influence you? And will you be able to resist their influence? What do you think is something that people don't know about you that they should? Um, well, what they don't know about me, I guess, is that I am not a person who gives up easily. Uh, I'm a fighter. And even though I don't yell and jump up and scream, uh, you'll probably not find anybody who's more tenacious than I am. What does that mean going forward? Let's say that uh, a low finish in, in, on February 1st, subsequent. What do, you, what, what do you see your role going forward? Well, I'm not looking at a low finish on February 1st. I'm looking at a, a good finish, and I'm looking at continuing to improve. But if I were one of those individuals, you know, who's polling 0, 1, 2 percent persistently, uh, I would drop out. What can we expect from you leading up to February 1st? How often are we going to see you here? What's your campaign strategy going to uh, be in Iowa? I will uh, be here. Uh, at least 16 days um, and I will be hitting a lot of different venues and talking to a lot of people and uh, you know the more people that I talk to the more people who actually get an opportunity to see who I am for themselves as opposed to who people say I am the better off we're going to be.